Remember, uh, um, if you remember, we the spirits. You know, Ephesians is talking. You know, kind of themes on. I think has this theme of spiritual blessings. And you know, we've talked. We've talked so far about uh, the spiritual blessing of how God has chosen us, um, how we were adopted through the predestination plan, how we were uh, redeemed uh, through Christ's blood. Uh, I think we talked last week about um, being made to know the mystery of his will. And tonight we're going to look at uh, this, other, this other one is that we obtain an inheritance. So we're going to look at that. And chapter 4 of Ephesians talks about that. I'll, let me read that verse to you there in Ephesians 1 so that you know what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse, uh, verse 11 That verse, it says, In whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we're going to look at that spiritual blessing of obtaining an inheritance in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me get back to that part of my notes. my place here. There we go. There we go. So let's look, we'll look at uh, these verses. Um, I really don't have anything for for one, but uh, I, we'll take uh, the first two verses there. Uh, Isaac, you want to read those first two verses there in Ephesians chapter 4? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. All right, so here we have this, uh, this, uh, this inheritance that God has given. And that, that inheritance is that vocation and that calling that God has placed on your life. That's that spiritual blessing. And he's going to spend the next 16 or so verses talking about this, uh, this, in, this inheritance that deals with that vocation and that calling. A vocation. What is a vocation? If you're gonna, if you're gonna describe it, what would you, what would you call a vocation? Job. Yeah, it's a job. Yeah, that's that's what God has wants you to do, and His calling. You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, God's calling on on their life to do this or that. Everybody's got a calling. Okay, God doesn't save you to just warm a position warm a seat somewhere, okay? He, God doesn't have bench warmers, all right? I know uh, some of you have played some sports, and, uh, you know, you spent more time on the bench than you did in, in the game. God does not have that kind of uh, sports, okay? Everybody's in the game. We're all in the game. You know, you have a job, and there is a specific piece that you're supposed to do in that job. Now, what Paul does in this is he really generalizes what these two things, um, how these two things function in a person because it's, he doesn't get specific. That's what I'm trying to say. He's, he doesn't get specific as to, well, this is your job or this is your job, but God reveals what you're supposed to do, but every one of our, every one of our vocations and calling incorporate these things that we're about to talk about. And it starts with verse 2. What do you see the first one that you that is right there? What do you see? It's a, it's a characteristic of this vocation and this calling. What's the first characteristic that you see right there? Lowliness. Lowliness. Yeah, what is lowliness? What do you think lowliness is? Putting others above you. Yeah, well. Like a humble position. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's more of a humble position. Yeah, there may be, there, you may look at other people, you really just... You really just don't look at yourself and and place people beneath you, okay? You look at everybody as they're made in God's image, right? They are they are special. God, they have a purpose. There is a calling that there's that there's no vocation that's better than others. Now, in our in our human world, we do that, don't we? We'll look at some people and we'll say, well. This person's job is more important than this person's job. 
you know, kind of like the president of the United States. We're like, that's the most important job in the country, right? So, so that should be a really high value job versus the trash collector. Is he really more, is the president more important than the trash collector? In our minds, well, yeah, that it should be, but it's not. It's not really. Do you know how upset you would be if you, uh, if the trash didn't run ever? You know how upset you would be? Yeah, you'd be really upset. How upset would you be if you didn't have a president? Well, we're experiencing that. Nope. So, so really, what's the most important job? Well, you know, we should I kind of joke about that because, you know, everybody kind of gets that right now. But the, the thing is, is that we don't look at our, we, we consider ourselves lowly. We don't try to place ourselves above others because of, the position that we hold and what we're doing, that there there should be no job that we're not willing to do, but God God does give each of us, you know, different, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, but each each has their own specific niche in this world, and we're not supposed to, and if God gives you a, a gift of whatever, you're not supposed to look at it and say, well, that one's better than this one. You know, Apostle Paul gets on to the Corinthians because they place... They placed emphasis on, on one type of gift over other types of gifts. And he's like, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. Love is more important than any of those things. Faith is more important than those things. Hope is more important than those things. Those other things, yeah, it's, it's, it's good if you can speak a million different languages. But at the end of the day, if you can do that without love, it's worthless, right? So here, the first characteristic of this vocation and this calling, this inheritance that we receive from God is to just try to put ourselves in a position where we do not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. That, that we have a lowly state, a humble opinion of oneself. That, you know, I, I'm here to just do my job the best of my ability. If, it, if it's a blessing to you, you know, that's, that's what I'm going for. I'm trying to be a blessing to other people around me. Uh, what's the next one, the next characteristic that we see in there? You see that? There's lowliness, and then there's what? Gentleness. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they use gen, they use meekness in there, right? Uh, some use meekness, some use gentleness. What is and and really, um, you know, the King James uses meekness. My definition is it's gentle power control of the power that you possess. What does that mean? What do you think that, that means? Yeah, Ephesians chapter four, and we're in verse two. So, so what is what does that mean to say it's gentle control of the power that you possess? What does that mean? What do you think that means, Noah? Now let uh, let me let me put it like this. I have the power. I could, you know I could I could I could I could choke you, right? I could choke you, and there shouldn't be much you that you could do about it. But should I do that? No, no. Even though I may power feel like it sometimes, control. right? Huh? Power under control. Yeah, it's power under control. I don't, just because I can doesn't mean that I do. You know, I operate off of, uh, off of, uh, you know, I don't use it to my personal benefit. You know, I use it, I, I'm using it for the vocation that God has given to me. I, that whatever it is that God has given me, that power the control that I use, I use it to glorify God. How, how many times do we see that through the scripture? That we are called to glorify God. That we, you know, we edify. We're supposed to edify the body. We don't edify ourselves. If we're trying to bring attention to ourselves, that means that's showing something about our heart. That our heart's not right. That that's what this is talking about. Being meekness. That I, you know, the power, that gift that God has given to me. Uh, I, it's gentle and it's under control, and I use it to to lift up God's people, to edify the body of Christ, to glorify our Father who's in heaven. Right? That's that's really what that means. That meekness there. Now, I'll, there's another one here in verse two. What is what is it? What do you see there? You got lowliness, meekness, and long suffering. Long suffering. What is long suffering? Yeah, what does it what is it what does it really mean? Patience. 
that means that you're willing to tolerate a bunch of nonsense, right? You know, um, parents, they have to deal with this all the time, don't they? They have to be long-suffering. Now, you know, that, and how many times are they going to, how they, are they going to tell you, listen, you need to pick up after yourself. Why, why in the world do you open up a package and you leave the paper on the counter? You know, how many times have you heard that? Clean your dishes off after you're through eating with them. And this is a routine that they go through every single day. Or maybe it's just me. I don't know. But what is that? Well, it's, it's parents operating off a of long suffering. They hadn't kicked you out yet. Well, yours haven't kicked you out yet. Um, well, we tried. We tried, and they came back. Um, so the parents oper operate off a long suffering. Well, it shouldn't just be the characteristic of parents to do that. It should be you doing that, too. A, a characteristic of your vocation and your calling should be that you are a patient person. You're long suffering. Yet, you may have to tell... Um, the same thing over and over again. I don't know, you know, how many times do, uh, you know, did God tell Israel, you know, you need, you need to turn, you need to turn back to me, over and over and over again. How many prophets did He send to them to give them that message? Man, we don't, we don't even know. We just heard about like fifty or sixty of them in the scriptures, but there may have been. There's probably hundreds of them, and he, and He's done the same thing with pastors. Why does He keep having to bring new pastors in the ministry to? To preach the same thing that's been preached for 2,000 years is because God is also long-suffering and patient, and he, and he keeps sending out that message so that people can, uh, can know him, so that they can be saved. So it's just, in, just patience, endurance, being consistent with what God has called you to do in that, in that inheritance, that spiritual blessing of that inheritance. Um, there's another one in there in verse 2. What's the, la what's the last one in there? What do you see, Noah? What's the last one in verse 4? I mean, verse 2 there, chapter 4. Um, love. Yeah, look, forbearing one another in love. So there's kind of two things different going on there. Forbearing one another in love. What is that? What is that? I'm trying to help you guys think about, you know, these scriptures. A lot of times we just fly through these and we don't stop to, to really ingest these things. What, what is this talking about? For bearing one another you're in... Doing life together. Yeah, you're doing life together, right? You're, you're Supporting you're, each other, encouraging each other. Absolutely, absolutely. You're holding each other up. You're enduring. You're sustaining each other. You're iron sharpening iron. If somebody's having a bad day, you, you know, you're there. You're going to do your best to uh, help them have a better day. You're going to be praying for them. You're going to be calling and checking on them occasionally. Doing those sorts of things. Um, let's look at verse 3. Eli, you want to take verse 3? Mm -hmm. Endeavoring to keep the unity <clears throat> of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So another characteristic of this inheritance, this vocation, this calling that's there, is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's kind of a lot in there. Put it in Eli's words. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> Is this saying like trying your best to like be close to God and have peace with God? Well, it, it is peace with God, and you're going to have peace with God if you have peace with each with other people around you, right? So you look at the so what it is is that in your vocation, your calling, because God, when you're saved, God doesn't pluck you out of this world, right? He keeps you in this world. So he, you, one of our jobs is to try to keep the unity and the peace with each other, right? That we don't try to stir up stinks, we don't try to stir up problems with each other. We try to keep that bond of peace, that unity, through the power of the Spirit. And you're only going to be doing that if you have that same bond and peace with God, right? So the two are kind of uh, syn uh, synonymous there, that we forbear one another in that agape love. That's really, I think that's where, you, where you're going, going with that, you know. It with God, if you if you have that agape love, you've got God's spirit in you, you're going to have that unity and love with God and with his people. So that that's that's part of that vocation, that calling. That's what we're that's what we're supposed to, regardless of what it is that is actually <coughs> your specific position in this world, whatever your specific vocation, whatever your specific calling. And those and by the way, those things change throughout your lifetime too. 
you know, your, your position, your calling will be modified as you grow in faith, the longer you live. Sometimes it's like you're just kind of thrust into to a position that you're like, I didn't ask for this, I didn't want this, but here I am. And, you know, God puts you there. You're the, you're the, you are the hero of the moment. And, you know, you take that, you, you take that as, well, God put me here for such a time as this, like Esther. Did Esther ask to be queen? Did she want to be queen? Did she ask for what Haman was doing to, to her people? No. But she was the only one who could do anything about it. She was there for such a time as this. She was thrust into that moment. And what and a lot of times that's what happens to us. That's our that's how you know you you've entered that vocation, that calling, is that you were thrust into that position. You didn't ask for it, you didn't want it, but here you are. What are you gonna do with it? Well, you need to do what Esther did. You embrace <coughs> it and say, you know what? I'm not sure if I'm gonna get it all right, but I'm gonna approach it by faith. And when you have a group like what she did, she called, she called everybody to fast and pray with her. And at the end of the day, evil Haman was dealt with, and God's people were, were secured. That's what happens when you embrace that vocation, that calling on your life, is that other people, other people will be saved around you. I mean, does it mean the hundreds or the thousands? It may not. It just may mean the ones and twosies. And that's okay. That's okay in God's eyes. Ones and twosies are just as important as the thousands. So here we are. Um, let's look at the, anybody got any more comments on any of that that we've talked about so far? Okay, let's look at verse four. Uh, nope, uh, Micah, you wanna take verse four? <coughs> there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. All right, so here we have the, that one hope, that characteristic of one hope. What are we talking about, that one hope, Micah? What do you think? Plan. Yeah, it's, it is that plan. Um, you know, Paul kind of talked about it with that predestination plan. That is our hope. That and and look what he says there. It says there's one body, one spirit, even as you are called. So he says that there's only one. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one body of believers, and they and they have this hope. They have this hope. That um, God's got a plan to fix everything. He's going to take care of the problems of this world. That evil does not, you know, rule the, you know, the end of the day. That God will rule the end of the day. Um, let's look at verse 5. Noah, you want to take verse 5? One in the Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Man, that's a hard verse right there, isn't it? I'll tell you what, take the next verse too. Take it. One God and Father of all. Yeah, Paul's being all complicated there, isn't it? In y'all, he's Just y'all, y'all, in y'all. He said you all, he might be southern, right? <laughs> all right, so here we have one Lord. So how does, how does one Lord fit that characteristic of vocation and calling uh, of the spiritual inheritance? What do, you, what do you think is going on with that? One Lord. I tell you what, we can probably we can probably put all these together. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. What are we talking about? What are we talking about right there? There's only one way. There's only one way, right? What is that way? What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, no man cometh unto the Father except through Him. That's what He's talking about. There's only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one faith. You've got to believe. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One baptism, that you're ba unless you're baptized with the, with the spirit of, uh, of, that, of Jesus Christ, of the comforter that's to come, you're not saved. You have to, you, those three things have to be applied. And that spiritual blessing, that vocation, that calling comes through that one Lord, that one faith, that one baptism. If you think you're going to come in some other way, you're wrong. Jesus said that's how the thief comes in. He comes in through it another way. He comes in through a back door. And that's why it's important for us as believers that we, that, you know, our, our bestest friends, 
our bestest friends, that they that they agree with that, that they agree. There's just one more. There's only there's only one one way one mode through salvation. That's through Jesus Christ. The world will teach you. Oh, there's a there's a bunch of ways to be saved. Um, you know uh, that you know that was kind of uh, Billy Graham's kind of on, on his on his in his last years. He kind of made a comment during an interview that there's many ways to God. Well. There's only one way to the God of the Bible, and that's through Jesus Christ. I'm not sure where, what he was thinking when he said that. That's not what he preached throughout his younger ministry. He said he would, he would claim that there's only one way, and, that, and that's Jesus, that there is one Lord, that there's not other lords. There's only one Lord. There's only one way to God through Jesus Christ, and that is the faith that we're talking about. So if you talk about, well, my faith, my faith, you have that doesn't there that's there's no such thing as your faith if you say my faith like that then you are actually creating almost an idol in your life it is the faith of in what jesus did i believe in the way you know when you look in the in the um the book of acts what do they refer to this this idea that we're talking about right now they called it the way right and that they take that off of Jesus because Jesus is the way. And so that, that, that was how they shortened that. They would just call it the way. They didn't call it Christianity. Christianity was a derogatory term that came up to those who believed in the way. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what this is talking about. One hope, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then there is that, that last one, one God and Father of all. And I want to show you a couple verses um, with this because it reaches back into into the Old Testament. Um, so turn to Isaiah chapter 45. You can mark your place right there in the scripture or in your Bibles if you want with something. Is everybody there in Isaiah 45? There's quite a few verses that we're gonna we're gonna look at because there's one God and Father of all. There's none other. You know there there are those folks out there that teach that there's that there's a, a council of gods that there's um, other other ones who are who. Who make up the Godhead, but there there really is only one. There's only one God, and Isaiah 45 teaches this. I think the best of all the of all the chapters in the Bible. Isaiah 45 really hones in. Now you can look in De Deuteronomy, you can look in other passages, but the, this chapter is dedicated to teach. There is only one God and Father of all. There's none else. Joy, will you look at that verse five? Will you read that? And I'm going to have you read a couple verses. So read verse 5 for us. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. So that verse teaches, there is none other. Look, uh, read verse 6. That they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Um, take verse 14. Thus saith the, the Lord, the laborer of Egypt, is that the right one? Yeah. Okay. And merchandise of Cush, and of the saven men of stature, shall come over you, and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you, and they shall come over in chains, and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, there is no other God. Look at verse 18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Uh, go to, skip down to 22. Okay. Look to me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. <coughs> so yeah, that verse it says, if you want to be saved, you've got to come through me. I am I am God, and there is none else. 
Read a final verse there at 21. Tell and bring forth your paint, yes, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God beside me, a just God and Savior, there is none beside me. So here we have all these verses here in, in chapter 45 that says, what? What is he telling us? There's no other God. There is no other God. There is, and if you're looking for salvation, you got to go through the God of the Bible. If you, um, if, if you, he even, he even goes so far there in 21, he says, you can take counsel with all, all these other folks, but there's even only one who could tell you about things to come. Now, a very interesting thing, if you, if you skip over and look at verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, ask of me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. He actually wants to tell you what's going to happen. But he says, you, you got to ask for it. A lot of times people don't want to, they don't want to know what's going to happen because it scares them. I think that a lot of times they... They know what's coming, but they, they're afraid of the, of the answer. Don't be afraid of the answer. God is good. How many times through there, he said, like, you can trust in me. I am the God. You don't have to worry about all those other, all those other gods out there that other religions are saying are so powerful. He's like, they're nothing. They're nothing. He's like, I've been fighting, I've been fighting those guys for, you know, forever. They haven't won a single battle. Look at the Egyptian gods. What battle did they win? He destroyed them all, destroyed the whole nation, fighting Egyptian gods. They stood no chance. It's almost unfair. It's unfair when, the God, when nations rise up against God and think that, okay, there, that there's going to be a fight. There's no fight. There's no fight. When, God's, when God is, is, is over their rebelliousness, they, they're done. They're done. They have no chance. Um. Because he is God, and there's none else. So if you think that there's any other person that you could pray to, any other thing that you could pray to, then uh, you're wasting your energy. They're not going to be able to help you. There's only one God. There's one, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. And the scripture tells us there's none else, that there's none else. So any, any thoughts on that? Let's look at verse 7 there. And back in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, verse 7. Sister Brenda, do you want to read a verse for us? You don't have to. Not now. Do you want to read a verse for us? Mm -hmm. Okay. Micah, take verse 7. Verse 4? Yeah. yeah. No, a verse, yeah, yeah, verse I, 7 yeah. of chapter 4. Yeah. But unto every one of us is given grace. Mm -hmm. According to the measure of the gift of Christ. All right, so there's the gift of Christ. So here we remember our idea. It's spiritual blessings. There's an inheritance that has been given to us, that vocation, that calling, a characteristic of this is the gift of Christ, what he has given to us. Um, listen to this verse. Um, because the gift of Christ, the scripture tells us that it's... Um, it comes in, in measurements. Does that, does that make sense? And I'm going to describe to you kind of what that means here in a minute. But listen to this verse from John chapter 3, verse 34. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, and he says, For whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure upon him. So there's actually, when God pours out the me a, on a person... He gives, a, he gives a measurement. But some people actually get, it feels like, let me, say, let me say it, you know, accurately. We all get the Holy Spirit. But there, but there is kind of a measurement of how the Spirit is used on us or in us, if that makes sense. But in Jesus, there was no measurement. It was like it, the cup was full, right, all the time. It was without measure. But listen to this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13. And I think it'll help, help us understand. It says, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure 
to reach even unto you. What is this talking about? That the gift of Christ is the Holy Spirit inside of you. But the Spirit's going to do different things in each one of us. Okay? And, and whenever you read in Corinthians and uh, I think it's, oh goodness, is it Galatians that talks about some more gifts of the Spirit? Romans talks about some of the gifts of the Spirit. That <clears throat> not everybody gets the same thing. That's what he's talking about. Not everybody's gift is the exact same. So to some people, they will be, they'll be prophets. To some, they will be teachers. To some, they have, they have administrative skills. To others, they have um, maybe other types of skills and gifts that God has, has given to them in a measure. I mean, even if you, let's say, even, even, in, the, even in those skills, maybe he's made you a teacher or, uh, or, or a prophet. Even those guys have different levels. Jonah just was not the prophet that Isaiah was, was he? There was different measurements that was poured out on those two guys. But the, the, the thing is, is are you faithful with all these things? Jesus gives the, the parable of the talents, right? To one, he gave one. The other, he gave two. Another, he gave five. He gave them different measurements. And he says, go and use them. Go and use them. What is God looking at? He's not looking at, at how... Uh, you know how great you are at using. Are you are you are you willing to use it? Period. Will you operate off of faithfulness? That, that's kind of what what I think is going on here in this gift of Christ. That that it is measurable, but the point is, God gave you something. He gave you something to work with. Now, just like <clears throat> you know, just like somebody who's uh, who uh, you know who who's training. You know, we were just talking about, you know, running and how to, how to run faster. That you have to train, okay? You have to train. You, you know you may start out being slow as a snail. But if you run every day, you will get faster. You will, your endurance will increase. You'll be able to go longer. I mean, the first time that you guys went out and rode bikes. I mean, were, were you able to do that first day what you can do now? Not even close, right? That's what the gift of Christ is, is in, in our life. That it is measurable and it grows as you grow. Does that make, does that make sense? That's, that's this gift. And he gives it to us. To the measure of the gift of Christ. So he gives you some stuff to work with. And then he expects you to grow that inside of you. He wants you to. Okay? Any more comments on those? Let's look at verses 8 through 12. Eli, you want to take those, those verses? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. This is through 12. Yeah, yeah through 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the equip work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So that idea that I just presented to you about that measure, 8 through 12, really capitalizes on that idea. And he says that he, he gives these different... The, the, and here he lines out some, and some specific vocations, which are jobs, right? He, that's, that people are given jobs, and even in those jobs, there's different <coughs> levels of those jobs. Does, it, does that make sense? That just because, you know, you, you know, there's one guy in the church that he's like the preacher doesn't mean that you don't have that same, the, the same gift, but at the time, it's a different measurement. You know, and, and what the scripture and what Paul is telling us, he says, you know, ex accept that in lowliness, okay, and grow it. Take that opportunity that you're where you're at to be faithful to the position that you're given. And if you're, and if God gives you more, then you accept more, okay. Whatever He gives you, you take it. You're just like the parable of the talents. You take it. Don't stick it in the ground. Grow it. Grow it. Because every one of us is given a job 
in the ministry. I know there's some other things going on in that verse. We're not talking about those things tonight. We are specifically talking about spiritual blessings on us, the characteristics of the vocation and the job that God has given to us. Let's look at verse 13, unless anybody's got any questions on, on that. Verse 13. Um, Isaac, will you take that? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man. You, did you know that the Scripture wants you to be perfect? And that perfection comes through that unity of faith that knowledge of the Son of God. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to say I'm going to say something here that uh, sometimes people people have a trouble with, but it seems to me, and I and I was here that the the younger I am and the younger I was in the faith, the more uh, disunified I was with other people who were also believers because they didn't believe like I did on every single thing. And I think that God actually, he, he puts that, he puts those divisions in there, um, you know, to keep us humble. He's going to straighten us all out one day, okay? But just because people don't agree 100% with you doesn't mean that they're an enemy. And we are supposed to look for ways of peace. There was already one verse that we talked about that. But God wants us to be of unity of faith. Now, what is... What, are, what, did we, what did we classify faith as? The way. Yeah, it's the way, the belief in Jesus, right? In what Jesus did. Now, after you believe in Jesus, how things work towards things in this world, we may agree differently. Like how the measurements are poured out on somebody. We may not agree on how the measurements are poured out. And really, what, and, and the younger you are, the more defined that you, the more specific you want it to be. Well, you have to do this if you're if, if you're saved. We will automatically see you do this right then. You won't do any more sin in your life. And, and really, what happens is, is there's a growth process that even the, that that Holy Spirit that's poured on you grows you in measurements. The longer you're the the longer you're a believer, the more perfect that you should be. The more you agree with God's word. And the less concerned you are about certain things that are unknowable, okay? You should, we shouldn't be dogmatic about things that we cannot know. Like the return of Jesus. Anybody know when Jesus is coming back? Anybody know exactly how he's coming back? Does anybody know what event will tell us it's time? Nobody does. But that's a very dog, dogmatic teaching, right? With some folks. That they're like, no, it's got to be this way. How can you be so certain about things that you cannot know? Okay, were, were you there when God gave the prophecy? No. Um, did God give you uh, the words from John? No, he gave those to John. And John says, I don't understand this, right? Daniel looks at it, he's like, I don't get it. But yeah, we do. You know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that when Jesus came the first time, they had already established a very dogmatic understanding of how things were supposed to work. And Jesus didn't fit their dogmatic doctrines, did he? And that's why they're, they're like, no, we can't accept him because he doesn't fit our model. I think God causes divisions in, in some of these things so that true believers will look for unity with people who really believe. And if they're going to be so caught up in all these other things that they're they believe those things over over what that what is really specific to just Jesus and salvation that they if you get so caught up in that you got to wonder like you know what <coughs> really what really are people thinking? I don't know if I am I talking too general or too complicated. But the thing is is that God, that there should be a unity of faith. And we, and we should be able to get along with other denominations. I'm not saying that, you know, that we should just accept any old thing that's being taught. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
But I'm saying that we should be able to um, have peace with those people that we shouldn't we shouldn't we shouldn't look for fights. We shouldn't go picking fights with other people. That we should we should say, yep, there are differences. God put those differences there for a specific reason. I think it's I think it all goes back to Babel. You know, in Babel, that whenever whenever there's a concentration of ideas, it usually leads towards a really bad idea. And I think that's what God does in the Christian world is that he has divided us up with these different ideas so that we don't concentrate towards a singleness of bad ideas. I mean, that's just kind of a theory that I have on why there's so many different denominations. But can I look at somebody from another denomination? Can I pray? Can I pray with that person? Is it okay to pray with somebody from another denomination? Is it okay to serve Jesus with a person from another denomination? I think it is. I think it is. Now, if we're going to start debating on the gift on how tongues works, or we're going to start talking about, you know, um, you know, uh, once saved, always saved. You know, I think those things, you know, drag us down in the mud. Now, there can be a specific way that you believe, according to the scriptures that God has shown you. He does that for a reason, and He has poured out that measure. Do we fully understand how all those things work? No. There's no way that I can fully understand how salvation works. But what I do know about salvation is that it only comes through Jesus Christ. Right? I can, can, can we, could every denomination um, that, that, calls, that calls on Jesus, could they agree with that? Yeah. Could I pray with that person? Most certainly I do. Could, could, I, uh, could I have fellowship in a, in a body like this every single Sunday? Uh, maybe not. I might, I might not be able to get along with them that well, you know. So I make, I, I find ways to make for peace. How do I do that? Well, I go to a different place to, to really serve God and to be taught according to the scriptures. Does that make sense? Is that, or is that clear as mud? Clear as mud? You know, anyway, uh, I think God does do that. Uh, probably spent way too much time there. But the thing is, is that we look for that unity of, not, of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That, that's, that needs to be where we grow the most. And as we grow in that, God will, at, you know, it, it really, when we, when we grow that measure that he's given to us, he begins to teach us according to the scriptures. And he allows the scriptures to really grow us. But, but you'll find out when you get to heaven um, that... Uh, you know, and unfortunately, I'm going to be the same way. I'm going to find out when I get to heaven that I really didn't know as much as what I thought I knew. The more I read the Bible, the more I feel like I don't know. That's, that's how I feel, um, even now. And that's a lot of years of studying the Scripture. I feel like I know less today than I did when I was 20 years old. When I was 20 years old, I had it figured out. I knew what was right, and I knew how people were supposed to serve God. And today, I'm like, uh I'm not even doing it right. How can I? How can I judge someone else? I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at sometimes. So, look at verses 15, 14, and fifteen. Who's up? No one. You want to take those? <coughs> now, as we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of it, men, men and consuming or con cutting craft, craftiness, yeah. yeah. But whereby thy lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love and may grow up into him and all things which is the head of the head, even Christ. All right, so here. These two verses, I should have just, I guess, kept reading a little bit because those verses really talk about that. That as we grow, that, that one of the characteristics of, the, uh, of that spiritual blessing is God is pouring out his measure through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're looking for the unity of faith and knowledge of God. But here we see that we're, we're not just, we don't just give in to every wind of doctrine that's out there. That we we look at the things that are and we figure them out according through God's word, right? 
that we allow the word of God to reveal the truth of the matter to us. Now, those who, who take one scripture out of its context and create a whole doctrine surrounding it, that should raise red flags all the time. That they're, that how, do, how do you interpret the scripture? You ever thought about that? How do you interpret the scripture? With scripture. With scripture, right. That there should be other scriptures that back that up. And if there are not other scriptures that back that up, then you've got a problem. you got a problem. And all of a sudden you've got the growing of a false doctrine, a false teaching inside of that. Now, if there's other scriptures that contradict your thinking process uh, at the tail end of that, well, then you need to, you need to go back and like, well... Um, I'll give you an I'll give you an example that there's some who teach that you should not have that you sh that you should ha have instruments in church in your worship assembly. In the Old Testament, did they have musical instruments in their worship assemblies? Yeah. All over the place. In the Book of Revelation, when you get to heaven, are there musical instruments in their worship assemblies? There sure are. Why would God say for you guys <laughs> y'all don't get y'all don't get to play instruments? It doesn't make any sense, right? So you got a false doctrine that's there. So if you see a false doctrine that's uh, that's caused such a major disunification, okay, you you kind of need to walk away from that. Does it mean that they that they're lost? It may not necessarily mean that they're lost, but they certainly got some bad ideas forming, and that you and, and that you shouldn't you should you you shouldn't uh, willingly because you don't know where the bad ideas stop, right? And that's what this, I think this is what it's talking about. Every wind of doctrine that's out there, you don't, we don't just take those and embrace every one. We, we, take those, we take those ideas and we bump them against the scriptures. Do they line up? If they line up, we, we should consider it. We, we need to do that. We need, you don't need to just take everything that I say and say, that's gospel. No, the words that I speak are not gospel. They are the things that... I am getting from what I receive from God's word. Can I be wrong? I can be. Have I been wrong? I sure have. And some of the things I've had to correct that you know that I've had to have a course correction in my own life. And you know what helped me get there? God's truth, His truth. And that's where we say, speak the truth in love, not being tossed by winds of doctrine or trick. Or trickery, those that cunning, that sleight of hand. That's what you were reading there. The sleight of men, there, Noah. That's that sleight of hand. You've seen those guys. They do those card tricks or make coins disappear. Those coins didn't really disappear. The cards didn't magically appear. It was sleight of hand, right? So there's trickery of men. It's a lie. It's fake. But they're 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 pulling the wool over your eyes, so to speak. <coughs> he says, for us, we don't just give in to every wind. But there may be somewhere that you're not accurate. Maybe, maybe you know, you're believing wrong, and somebody reveals the truth to you, or they reveal something to you, like, oh, maybe I should relook at that. It might mean something. Let me study it. And that's what the scripture says: study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing that word of truth. That this this passage is talking about that. That inheritance, that vocation, that job. Let's look at our last verse here in verse 16. Joy, do you want to take that one? From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. All right, this, is, this verse just sums it up. All those things that we've been talking about tonight, you know, you, you look at it and say, well, where do I fit in, okay? Where do I fit in? And then plug in. Plug in. Everybody should be willing to plug in. I know I went to, uh, we, we had moved, I think, from, um, I don't know, somewhere. I can't remember where, where we moved from. And I went, I went up to the pastor, and I'm like, hey, um, you know, we, we want to join the church, and we want to do stuff. And his idea was we wait two years or so before we do anything in the church. He wanted to make sure we, we were okay. And I'm like, 
No, that's not how I work. I'm like, I'm going to be gone in four years. I want to start yesterday. Like, find me, where can I plug in? I think that was when we were in Utah. I think it was at Faith or so. So uh, they, they didn't want us just plugging in and wanted us to wait like two years. Um, now there, we didn't have a lot of selection of churches to go to. Um, so what we ended up doing is we just we just found a hole and we just we just went and plugged in it, and within a few within a year um, we were all over the place, weren't we? So you find if you are if you're a believer, you want to plug in, find a place, plug in. There's always there's always room. There's always room. You just you know you see a need, you feel the need, and honestly, that's kind of how. You know, that I think that's how God works a lot of times. Is that He reveals to you a need, and when He reveals that to you, you're the you're the you're the guy. You're the person that it, God is saying, "Okay, you see it. I have I have shown it to you. You're the person." You know, a lot of times, whenever I think when we're in churches, people uh, people will go to the pastor and say, "Hey, that needs to be fixed over there." That needs to be done. And really what the problem is, is that God has told that person, you need to do it, and they're rebelling against God and not doing it. And you know what happens to that church? You know, it, it, the, one person can't do it all. And if the person is, will, is unwilling to fulfill the need that God has actually called them, okay, if they have opened up their eyes and they have seen the need, that is their vocation, that is their calling, and they are saying no, and they want to, it is not their job to delegate all those things. God has delegated it. He's the head, and he has revealed it through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a need there. Um, it's your job. It's your job. So, with that, anybody got any, any thoughts or comments? Well, let's close in prayer. Um, anybody have anything specific they uh, they need to pray for or they want to pray for? I think remember, uh, there's a bunch of sick folks right now, so uh, remember them. For specifically, I know Bill, Bill Knight and Larry Newman are. Um, and anyway, that's the that's too specific. I think Sister Louise is sick too. She had some tests this past week too, so. Noah, you want to you close this out tonight? Sure. Dear Lord, thank you.